Uh, good afternoon. If you are in Africa, it has just gone 3 p.m. in East Africa, uh, 2 p.m. in Central Africa, and 1 o'clock in the afternoon in West Africa. So really excited to be with you this afternoon. 
Uh, this is a particularly important webinar. It's a 90-minute session, um, and we are discussing this afternoon the prospects for aquaculture development in Africa, particularly looking at a review of past performance to assess future potential. I will be introducing you to the guests and the panelists in a second or two. If we just run through some information before we start, um, I'm excited to say we had well over 600 people register for this webinar. Many people obviously watch the recording afterwards, so the live audience is a lot less than that. But uh, I can report that we received registrations from 63 countries, and of those, 32 were in fact African countries. Um, those of you that have attended AAM webinars before, You'll know this little pie chart, and it stays very consistent from webinar to webinar, where our registered audience uh, consists of about 75% uh, from Africa and the rest from Europe, America, and Asia. But uh, always nice to have countries from outside of Africa joining us. Um, I know we've got a strong following in India, uh, in Pakistan, um, I'm trying to think of some South American countries also that have joined us this afternoon in Panama. So welcome to everybody that, uh, that has tuned in. Uh, leading the pack in Africa is Nigeria. 24% um, of the African registrations came from Nigeria, followed by Kenya, South Africa, Egypt, Uganda, and Zambia. And I can tell you off that list in seventh place is Malawi, um, which uh, is great to have you guys in numbers with us uh, today. You know by this stage that AAM is a media partner to the African chapter of the World Aquaculture Society. I'll be introducing John Walakira shortly, president-elect for the society. So uh, really exciting to have him on board with us today. Just some arrangements before we get going. Um, please use the chat panel, uh, say hi to us, tell us where you are in the world, it's always really nice to see you who's online um, and share your email address and share your interest on the chat panel. It's really nice to hear from you. Use the Q&A panel for questions. Um, it's easier for us to find them when they are in the Q&A panel. I have taken questions from the registration process as well. Um, and we will try and allow enough time to cover that in our discussion at the end. This webinar is recorded. So uh, by tomorrow, you in your email, you'll receive a link to the recording. Um, you'll get an email also with the presentation slides in it tomorrow. Um, just a word on certificates. This is a discussion webinar. It's not a training session. So we do not issue certificates uh, for attending these webinars. And then lastly, I can confirm that I'll be showing the email addresses of all of the panel members right towards the end. These webinars are not possible without uh, our sponsors. Um, AAM have come quite a long way now, running for almost two years in this platform, bringing you information on aquaculture every two weeks or so. Um, and this is made possible purely because we get backing from Worldfish. Uh, Worldfish has got a strong African footprint and uh, we look forward to doing lots more work with them as we keep uh, building from strength to strength. Scretting as a lead leading global feed supplier has a lot of interest in Africa. Uh, they also make these sessions and the information that we share possible. And then lastly, the World Initiative for Soy and Human Health. Um, you may ask why soy uh, in fish farming, but soy is becoming a integral ingredient in, in fish feeds. And for that reason, They've uh, joined us to make these webinars possible. Right, on to the matter of today. Um, a recent paper was released, uh, the title of the paper, Prospects for Aquaculture Development in Africa, a review of past performance to assess future potential. Uh, several people uh, contributed to this paper. Um, I was lucky enough myself to, to contribute. John Wallakira, which I'll introduce in a second, um, S. Langi, N.A. Ibrahim, um, V. Torres, uh, Lanre 
sorry, the slide flicked over Landre Badmus from, um, from Nigeria, which many of you will know. And then Haik uh, Baumuller, which I'll introduce in a second, uh, contributing. And, and I would say she was the engine behind uh, making this, this paper possible. So this paper is what we will be discussing today. Um, I will also be sharing a link where you can access the paper and uh, hope to bring you some exciting insight around uh, the state of aquaculture in Africa. My fellow guests today, if I can introduce them, uh, let's start with Heik, um, Heik Baumuller. Heik, uh, as I've just said, is the engine that has made this paper possible. Um, there were times when I saw information flowing and the next morning you'll see Heik has got it all organized. So Heik, uh, welcome to the panel today. And um, can I please ask you to perhaps just say a few words about yourself and where you work and, uh, and particularly the organization that has made uh, the publication of this paper possible. Thank you, Heik, over to you. Thank you very much, Etienne, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Heike Baumler and I work for the Center for Development Research or CEF for short at the University of Bonn in Germany. And I'm a senior researcher and uh, for this particular uh, activity, I'm, I also coordinate a project, PARI it's called, which focuses on trying to identify and scale innovations that can promote agricultural growth, employment and food security in Africa. And recently we've been um, delving much more into aquaculture as well as an integral part of agricultural development and also an important source of um, food and <clears throat> nutrition security on the continent. And the project is funded by the German Development Cooperation as part of a much larger project on agricultural development in Africa. Fantastic, Heik. Uh, really nice to have you on board. And um, it's been a pleasure working with you on this paper as well. Um, John, John Wallachira is one of those people which I, I don't want to introduce because we all know him. Um, <laughs> John, uh, John is based at, at NARO, at Kajansi in, in Uganda. Many of you have worked with him. I've had the pleasure of working with John. Uh, John also is, as I said at the start, president-elect for the Was African chapter. John, over to you, if you could say a few words about who you are and, uh, and where you work. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Etienne. Um, maybe I just want to clarify that I work in uh, an institute called Abi Zono Agriculture Research and Development Institute. It's just at the near River Nile, west of River Nile, and between uh, uh, DRC and Southern Sudan. I'm well placed there. So I'm, I'm, I'm the director of research there. And uh, we, we do applied and uh, applied research, um, but also we disseminate technologies to the end users. So we are very close to the end users. Aquaculture is one of the key issues that we also address, but also with other things. So I'm the director of research of that institute uh, in the National Agricultural Research Organization, which is a center of excellence for Eastern and Eastern Central Africa. Um, and and uh, as you really well mentioned, that I am the president-elect, uh, soon to become the president of World Aquaculture Society in March, God willing, when we if nothing happens again. Um, so, but also I, I attained my degree in Auburn University, New USA, where I, I gain all this knowledge in aquaculture, but biased, of course, in uh, aquatic animal health. Over to you. Thank you very thank much. You. And happy to thank this. you, John. Really honored to have you with us today and, and thank you for your time. I can see many people greeting on the chat panel. Please keep those greetings coming. It's really nice to hear from you. I see we've got Max Trull all the way from Sweden saying it's really cold out there. So welcome, Max. Uh, Nuet from the Seychelles. Uh, really nice to hear from all of you. Nuet, I'm really looking forward to doing some training in the Seychelles later this year. But please keep those comments in the chat panel coming. It's really nice uh, to hear from, from all of you from across the world. Right, as an introduction to, to this paper that we're discussing today, um, I'd like to just say that you, when you work in aquaculture, you hear people um, constantly asking, 
which is the leading country in African aquaculture? And, and I think it's human nature for us to ask that question. Um, but I think we need to delve deeper into, into the meaning of that. Um, because for many years, we've been looking at absolute production volume, and, and we've used that as, as a measurement of how well uh, countries are performing in, in aquaculture in Africa. And uh, we couldn't be much further away from the, the true situation on the ground, because there are so many factors that influence the absolute production volume. Um, referring to the endowment of a country with natural resources, referring to the size of a country, the population of a country, uh, referring to the economic indicators of a country. And when you start comparing countries in the aquaculture production measured against those other baseline indicators, then you realize that um, we need to think more carefully about how we measure aquaculture performance from country to country in, in Africa. Just grading countries by absolute production is, is giving us a very shallow and meaningless answer as, as to what the actual detail is around aquaculture growth and, and performance on the continent. So this paper has provided an opportunity to delve into those deeper questions around performance. Um, I can start off by just saying that the general trend and this top graph uh, follows from 2000 to 2018, and it just gives one a general indication of the volume and value of aquaculture production in Africa. Um, many people, when you speak just over a, a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, will say, well, aquaculture, why is it standing still in Africa? And it's, it's actually not the case. Um, if you have a look at the numbers, aquaculture is accelerating in Africa. And in fact, the, the rate of acceleration is, is one of the highest in, in the world. So against that background, um, we can say not only is aquaculture growing rapidly in Africa, but, uh, but we need to go and have a look at where it's growing. And uh, the follow on from that is, is to look at the reason for growth. The graph at the bottom gives you a contribution of aquaculture to total production of aquatic foods. Um, and there also, interestingly, uh, you can see in the African context, the contribution of aquaculture to total uh, fisheries is, is relatively low compared to other continents. And uh, certainly there is a lot of room for, for growth in Africa to up that percentage of contribution to, uh, to total fisheries. So the methodology that was followed in, uh, in putting this paper together, um, various criteria were selected. And there on your screen is a list of the criteria, uh, including total fish supply per capita, contribution of aquaculture to national fish supply, the per capita shortfall to you to reach the average African fish consumption, the absolute production volume, like I've referred to previously, um, including the compound growth rate, then the per capita production, the absolute production value, the per capita production value, value of production per ton, the contribution of aquaculture to GDP, and aquaculture production by renewable water resources. Now, having selected all of those criteria, it was important to then establish where we would get all of the information to to be able to draw a, a, a good comparative analysis uh, around all of these criteria. And um, information around aquaculture in, in Africa has been questioned for many years, the accuracy of it, um, but we have used the, the, the well-known resources of information that are available. Um, most people are aware of the aquaculture statistics that are collected by the FAO, and that formed a, a very solid basis for this information. Um, there was also a lot of information that was drawn from, uh, from the World Bank, uh, particularly around matters like GDP and so forth. And all of that information was fed into this comparative analysis uh, so that we could publish the results that we will bring you over the next few slides. So as an introduction, I would like to, to leave it there. Um, 
I'm now going to hand over to Hake, and uh, Hake is going to take us through in a discussion through the first few indicators, and uh, then I'll deal with some more indicators, and we'll come back to John uh, just to, to do a little bit of uh, comparison between countries and look at the implications for policy and for research. Hake, it's over to you. Um, I will leave these in first few indicators to you. Thank you, Hake. Thank you, Etienne. <clears throat> and we quite deliberately started our list of indicators by looking at uh, food supply and food security related indicators, because we are interested, as Etienne was saying, not just looking at production or aquaculture production for the sake of production volumes or even values, but really also at the role of aquaculture as a source of uh, nutritious uh, food. So we deliberately start off by looking at a few food security related indicators. So the first is uh, around total fish supply per capita. Here we are looking at all fish supply, not only aquaculture, because we wanted to see what is the role of a fish um, in, the, uh, in the economy. And here we uh, find that the, or the data shows us that the average per capita fish consumption in Africa is around 10 kilos or was in 2018, which is about half of the global um, consumption per capita. And uh, about 13 countries are above global average and 15 countries are above, above the African average. And what is interesting, of course, since this is global fish, uh, this is total fish supply, that a lot of the countries that have high consumption levels are island states or coastal states, um, apart from in this, uh, in this case, Zambia, Malawi and Uganda. Namibia tops the list, uh, followed by Mauritius, Mauritania. So you see, you see the countries in the list as well. And you can see all of that in the paper in more detail as well. And if we go to the next slide, we then want to focus on the role of aquaculture more specifically. And this, of course, where is where the numbers and uh, colors on the map change quite substantially. So I think it is probably well known to this audience that Egypt is um, the largest uh, large producer of aquaculture products. And here it's also reflected in the share of um, aquaculture contribution to national fish supply, which is over 60%. Um, then there's a this sort of slight oddity of Lesotho being very high up there, which could in fact be rather an issue of uh, underreporting of exports to South Africa. But then as you go on in the list, then uh, it drops very quickly below 30%. So, uh, and then also very quickly below 20%. So the share of aquaculture as a contribution to fish supply is um, rapidly drops and is still quite quite small in many countries. Uh, next slide, please. We also wanted to see where the biggest gaps are because um, part of it is, is to understand the role of fish and aquaculture in food supplies, but it's also to understand potential demand. Because if we think about where should we best invest in aquaculture development, we also we don't just need to look at where are the best conditions for aquaculture development, but also where might be the highest demand. And we recognize, of course, that this is simplistic to simply calculate the difference between um, availability of fish and uh, sh per capita sh um, shortfall, because there are many reasons why fish is eaten or not eaten is not only a question of supply, we understand that. But nevertheless, it's interesting to see um, in some of the countries um, that are highlighted here, Ethiopia being high, uh, high on the list, um, but also other countries that have a really um, uh, just under 10% um, or somewhere between 6 and 10% of shortfall in fish production or fish supply per capita. And depending on cultural preferences and alternative meat alternatives, these could be potential markets as well to um, attract investments to uh, contribute protein uh, supplies in the country. Next slide, please. Um, we then went to, well, the slightly more traditional types of indicators that are often used when we talk about performance. So the next indicator is around production volumes. And here, um, which is what I already mentioned earlier, is that Egypt is just far ahead in Africa in terms of its aquaculture production. And um, in, 
just the country alone produced 1.6 million tons for 2018, which is more than twice the total production of all the other countries together. So it's um, sometimes, uh, if you want to understand the diversity in the rest of the country, it's, um, it's you almost have to sort of look at Egypt as an outlier in the in the remaining countries. Um, also interesting is that marine aquaculture is fairly li limited as a share of total aquaculture, um, con which is somewhat surprising, really, given the um, marine resources that are that are there. And we also see that uh, annual growth rates are quite different. When you look at annual growth rates, um, you suddenly see completely different countries emerging in with high growth rates than um, if you look at actual production volumes. Next slide. And this is again the numbers to um, to highlight them. So um, you see Egypt here with a very large blue bar in the graph at the bottom. And you also see we also cal calculated volume growth because we wanted to understand not only the current production, but also the dynamics of production. Because again, this is an, an indicator of where the industry might be in that dynamic enough to um, be suitable for additional investments. So in terms of absolute production, Egypt um, is, is very high on the list in Nigeria as well. But if we look at compound uh, annual growth rates, you have countries like Rwanda, Burundi, or Lesotho at the top, sometimes, of course, starting at a very low base. So you quickly get to high um, growth rates. But then you also have countries like Malawi, Mauritius, and Tunisia, which exhibit quite high growth rates. And we'll see in the next slide um, if we then check, um, if we look at production volumes per capita, can we go to the next slide? Um, if we look at production volumes per capita, you have these countries that are showing high growth rates like Tunisia, um, Mauritius, Malawi, they are now appearing in the top 10 countries of uh, production per capita as well. Again, Egypt is, um, is right at the top, but uh, and you can see that other countries are also um, increasing their volumes as well. And I'll hand over back to Etienne to do the indicator 6 to 10. Thank, thank you very much, Heik, uh, for those for running us through those first five indicators. And I, I really believe the audience can see that there's, there's a, a real big difference when you start looking at the two criteria as to where the countries lie. Um, yes, Egypt uh, does stand out as, as the leader on the continent. Um, but there are some very interesting dynamics when we start bringing the, the other indicators uh, into play. Um, the next indicator that we looked at is production value, and, and this particularly is total crop value. Uh, this is not value per ton, which we dealt with on, on, a, on a different slide. Um, and yes, total production, we've heard, we've heard in Egypt uh, dominates in Africa. Um, but if you look at a, at, a, at a situation, for instance, South Africa, which ranks at position number six in terms of total crop value, but only stands at, uh, I think it's, oh, sorry, my slides are gone. Getting to the correct slide. But it only stands at position 13 in terms of absolute production volume. Um, so you can see that. Something in South Africa is different to the rest of the continent, and it's uh, quite clear that there's a high value species that's being farmed, particularly marine uh, abalone and oysters and mussels, and that's why the total crop value is much higher, uh, despite the fact that uh, South Africa only ranks in, in absolute production volume. An interesting scenario also in Tanzania, where the compound annual growth rate uh, for their aquaculture sector lies at 45%, while the compound annual growth rate in volume only sits at 11%. And we really scratched our heads as to why this could be. And the simple answer is, is that the, the, the price of fish seems to be going up very rapidly in, in Tanzania. There could be other influences, for instance, the, uh, the influence of, of seaweed in that calculation. Um, but certainly it's interesting one when one starts looking at all of these numbers. So once again, um, just a, a, a graphic illustration of what I've just said, uh, production value, total production value. You can see the countries in dark blue that, uh, that lead. Um, as I've said on, on a few occasions now, Egypt right at the top, 
Um, but some interesting uh, scenarios with uh, other countries coming in onto that top 10 list. Uh, you can see Zambia is there, Tunisia is there, and Uganda is there. Um, so total crop value uh, really giving us quite, uh, quite an interesting picture. The next indicator was value per capita. Um, so in essence, if you've got a relatively high crop value and you've got a relatively low population, you should be coming in high on this graph because uh, you've got a high contribution of, uh, of aquaculture value to, to per capita. Um, it's an important indicator because it gives us a good sense of the economic contribution of aquaculture in a country. Again, uh, Egypt leads this, uh, but it's followed in second place by Lesotho and in third place by Mauritius. Um, the case in Lesotho is uh, they farm a high value product in, in rainbow trout. Uh, that product, virtually all of it is exported to South Africa. And Lesotho has a relatively small population size. Um, and that's the reason why they've topped into second spot uh, on that particular indicator. Um, in Mauritius, much the same, it's a high value product. Uh, Red Drum makes out much of that product, it's high value species, and Mauritius has a relatively low population number. So uh, Mauritius comes in at third place around value per capita. This is just once again a illustration of what it looks like, uh, the numbers that I've just given you. Uh, you can see the countries in dark blue that lead value per capita. If you have a look at the little uh, bar chart at the bottom, you can see which countries are coming in uh, in the top 10 position. Um, some very interesting countries, Madagascar coming in there, and then interestingly enough, uh, Zimbabwe um, coming in at 10th place around the value per capita for their aquaculture production. We had to look at value per ton as well. Um, so you remember two or three slides ago, I referred to total crop value. But if you take total crop value and you divide that by total production, you get an indication of value per ton. In this instance, the leading countries uh, are Lesotho. Lesotho actually comes in number one. If you take uh, the total crop uh, value and divide by total volume. And then followed by South Africa and, and Mauritius, uh, South Africa, I've already indicated, have high value marine species, although the total production is not that high. Um, and interesting, Egypt leads in, in almost all categories, but Egypt only ranks 42nd in value per ton. And that gives us a clear indication that uh, Egypt sits with a, a low value species and, and that that species uh, doesn't demand a, a, a very high price, both in the market internally and, and any export that takes place as well. Putting that into some graphic detail, again, changes the map completely. If you have a look at the value per ton, some interesting countries also that, uh, that show up on the top 10. Um, if we have a look at that top 10, led by Lesotho, then followed by South Africa, Mauritius, Morocco, interesting, Madagascar, Angola, Malawi, Equatorial Guinea, Tunisia, and Niger. Um, as, as the top 10 list. So what is important here is you can see as we move these criteria around, um, there's a different set of countries in, in Africa that, uh, that take the lead. And this, as you will hear in a few slides time from John, is what we need to start considering when we think about uh, not only the leading countries in Africa, but uh, how we go about doing research and policy uh, around aquaculture on the continent. The ninth indicator was the contribution of aquaculture to gross domestic product. And here also, it's a valuable indicator because it indicates the economic importance of aquaculture to any particular country. GDP, as many of you will know, ranges very widely in Africa. Uh, the GDP per capita um, for many impoverished countries is, is exceptionally low, some of the lowest in the world. Um, in fact, there is only one country in Africa where the GDP per capita is higher than the global average, and that uh, is the island nation of the Seychelles. Um, so not only is it important to, to realize that aquaculture can make a significant difference uh, in Africa due to 
the importance that it could play in, uh, in the economic uh, contribution it makes to a country. Once again, the interesting case of Lesotho, um, where its very young aquaculture industry now makes a significant contribution to the GDP of that country. It's a high value product, rainbow trout, which is exported and which earns really valuable currency, uh, foreign currency for that country and, and really plays a, a major economic role. However, on average, the contribution of aquaculture to GDP in Africa remains well below the global average. And uh, that also il illustrates that there is much room for improvement and growth. So the contribution of aquaculture to GDP, just illustrating that visually, uh, once again, the map of Africa showing where the contribution to GDP is, is highest. Uh, the bar graph on the right-hand side showing the countries uh, that are leading in, uh, in contribution or relative contribution to GDP. GDP. Um, if you go down that top 10 list, interesting countries that come up, Malawi. Uh, so aquaculture proving to be really important uh, to, to that country's economic performance. Uh, Ghana, Zambia, Tunisia, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe once again, um, where aquaculture is making a really significant contribution to those countries' economic welfare. The very last indicator that we had a look at in this uh, study was aquaculture production relative to renewable water resources. Um, when we started off the study, it, uh, it became clear that not all countries have the same access to, to water, whether that be freshwater or marine. Um, not all countries have the same climate and other natural resources that can support aquaculture. And it became important to, to compare countries uh, relative to, to these variables. Comparing countries by climate and natural resources uh, was less valuable. Uh, we did at one stage look at uh, marine space and exclusive marine space for each country. That didn't prove all that valuable. And we settled on looking at aquaculture production relative to renewable water resources. Um, also because there was some reliable data around how much renewable water, freshwater, inland water resources each country, uh, each country had access to. Aquaculture depends on water, so production relative to water availability uh, we can look at, it's, it's possible. And using renewable inland water resources or the volume of that um, created a very nice calculation. Once again, Egypt led, uh, led the pack. Um, those of you that know Egypt will know it's a dry country. It's uh, fed primarily by the Nile in terms of renewable water resources. Um, but the Nile provides a lot of water and Egypt tops the list in terms of production volume relative to how much water they have available. Other countries that uh, reach the top 10 here is Uganda. Ghana, Nigeria, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Kenya, Lesotho, and Burundi. Um, so illustrating that those countries are using their renewable resources relatively well for the production that they are achieving. All right, those are the indicators that we used in this study. Please remember, I will share a link to, to this paper uh, shortly after the discussion. Um, there are also some announcements that you need to stick around for, particularly if you are involved in aquaculture research or if you're a student. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand back over to John. And John is going to just discuss in, in a slide or two um, some country comparisons and then also uh, looking at um, the implications for, for policy and research. John, back over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Etienne and Haik, for giving me giving us that highlight. Actually, you made my um, my presentation very easy because uh, that background is exactly what we are going to discuss in this table: um, country com country comparison as well as also the regional uh, comparisons. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, when when you look through all what has been presented previously, we we you find that under this table, we did the comparison under the production volumes, uh, the agro growth roads, um, production volume per capita, 
uh, the production values and uh, even the growth rate of those values and what you see uh, before you, we, we found that Egypt is actually prominent in all those factors when you rank them from one to 10. Egypt is coming up with all those factors and, and the indicators, as I previously said, resources um, in terms of uh, technologies, when the technology was also contributing to this. And, and even the market value, I mean, the market uh, also had that impact on this. But we find that Egypt is um, actually coming up very prominently in all these factors that we have described above. And then we find also uh, Nigeria, Uganda, and a little bit um, of, of Zambia also appearing in that. But one thing that is unique in this paper is that there's other countries that we had never thought of when we're including these other factors, um, when we're including these other indicators, um, they, they now come up prominently, like Rwanda, um, Burundi, Lesotho, uh, because of those factors which hey, I mean, Etienne has described previously. So just to summarize this is, is that uh, this, this paper has come up with, um, pulled up all the other countries um, and, and it gives us more baseline for the policymakers or the planners to exactly see where the interventions that are coming in. But ideally, <clears throat> it's basically the technology and in terms of technologies, feed and seed have contributed a lot to these uh, growth of these ones, uh, these, these countries that are coming up very well. And, and also the issue of uh, <coughs> policy. Uh, we have uh, very many countries adopting now aquaculture, uh, um, which, are, which is now promoting aquaculture development in their countries. That is very key. Uh, without those policies, I mean, you cannot promote or develop aquaculture. But the other issue also is the demand for fish. I think it's now realized that uh, in Africa, there's a lot of demand for fish. Even what is being produced, <laughs> uh, like in other questions, uh, it's, it's being even exported from aquaculture. So in terms of aquaculture production per capita, uh, it's highest in Egypt, estimated around 16.2 kilograms. But this is even very low per person, per annum. And when you go to other countries, it's followed by Ghana and, and Uganda, where it is 2.6 and 2.4, respectively. This is very low. And that's why we see that even when you compare with the capture fisheries, aquaculture still has an up and to you know, fulfill to supply the total food supply to even our homesteads, especially the vulnerable communities. Um, and then in terms of value, like Etienne said, um, it's, it's because the fin fish, which they're delaying, yes, they're producing enough, but it's mainly fin fish. But when you go to the other, when you diversify, when other countries are diversifying into maybe shrimps or um, shellfish, shrimp, mollusks like in South Africa, you find the value is also uh, coming up. The, the other countries are coming up like Lesotho, which is dealing with uh, and Lesotho and South Africa, we, where they're dealing with mollusks as well. So it also depends on the value uh, where aquaculture is also considered important in the, in the sector. Um, then the other issue is about regional aspects. Uh, in terms of North Africa, Egypt comes out very well, um, very well because of the absolute production and also the other indicators which we've already highlighted previously. In East Africa, Uganda is still coming up very well, but we, we see other com countries coming up. Kenya, Kenya is one country, when you look at the statistics, it's the highest growth it has, it's coming up very fast uh, when you consider the regional blocks. Uh, in South Africa, of course, uh, Southern Africa, not South Africa, Southern Africa, Zambia is leading in absolute production. But in terms of value, again, it's, it's Lesotho, I mean, Lesotho, South Africa, because they're also dealing with the other marine species which are high valued uh, in nature. And then uh, West Africa, Nigeria is a power there. Um, and of course, followed by Ghana. And when you consider absolute values and even uh, agro, what do you call it? Average growth rates, uh, their capita volume per capita, 
and even the Central Africa DRC. Um, DRS is also coming um, very prominent in, in their statistics when you look at them, when you consider those uh, statistics. However, uh, it's, it's still very low. So for example, in DRC Congo, which is leading by 0 0.112 kilograms per annum, um, which is very low in Africa, followed by Cameroon. Cameroon, surprisingly, which has, uh, if you look at the literature during the random uh, uh, the, the intervention of World Fish Center. Uh, the, the law is still stagnating, um, but we don't see, but we see DRC coming up very well. Uh, the the, the growth, growth rate is increasing uh, annually. There's a lot of improvement in DRC. We, we, we see, we, we saw other countries which have never, Sao Tome, Prince Pei, these are also coming up in, in our in our literature, I mean the, the information which you've just searched. So we see these uh, emerging uh, countries coming up. Next slide. So what what is this in terms of implication uh, for policy and research? Yes, we need to see that there's the support for implementation of the existing policies and initiatives. Africa, we are blessed that we have a, a very good uh, policies. African Blue Economic Strategy. If you look at it, it, it's wonderful, well stipulated. But if you see the member states that can adapt this uh, strategy, I believe there will be more uh, uh, development in aquaculture, plus even the underlying uh, policy framework and reform strategy for fisheries and aquaculture. This is actually guiding us when whenever we're formulating our four policies. So we, it's, it's upon us, the member states, to see that we, the, the it's the, 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 the policies are there, and these are developed in an African Union. So it's upon the member states to adopt these and, and use these to implement or develop and even promote aquaculture in our fellow countries. And it shouldn't be even just individual member states, but even regional economic committees can even adapt these and even promote aquaculture. Of course, with this internally, we've seen the role of women not only women, even the youth, in uh, driving this sector. We have to gender mainstream the issue of, I mean, gender mainstreaming. Uh, aquaculture programs should come up with, with, um, with the working together or participate, working together with women organization. A uh, case in point is the African Women Fish Processors Traders, um, Traders Nito. We call it our fish net. This is one. A, a continental organization which we can work with. It's the ones which understands the dynamics, the problems of women who are participating in this uh, aquaculture value chain. And there are very many in terms of seed production right across up to uh, you know, uh, post-harvest issues and marketing. We have to fund research to understand the dynamics of, of these women. Uh, because we, these, these are the ones who are actually driving this, uh, this, this sector. Of course, uh, with the intensification of uh, the industry or the sector, there are issues of environmental issues. We don't want to, we, we, let's borrow a leaf from the uh, Asian. They've have at least uh, gone through these uh, challenges, but we can borrow a leaf from them and make sure that whatever we're doing uh, we're adopting is a sustainable aquaculture practices and which will not uh, pollute the environment. And what we mean by that, issues of genetic uh, pollution, there, there's a lot of institutions to import, um, to import uh, genetic resources from other countries in the name of improving or getting fast growing strains. But how do we deal with that? It's research. Maybe we need to improve on the research in the continent. Issues like uh, pollution to the environment, the immediate environment, local environment. Uh, I think they, like in Kenya, if along Lake Victoria, which is well, but you, there's a lot of reports. There's a lot of cages around the, the Lake Victoria, but what are the mitigation uh, processes? And this can only be done not only by Kenya and especially the shared lakes, those great lakes, fresh lakes but it can be done uh, in, in, in combination with that uh, other countries, regionally, regional approach, I believe will be uh, very good. And this will ultimately produce 
water pollution and eutrophication. I don't want to leave the issue of also diseases. This is an emerging issue. Very recently, we had uh, uh, the issues of TLV. Of course, those are issues which need to verify in our country. And those are associated to um, aquaculture. ISKNV, which was also soon re recently reported in uh, Ghana, but we don't want this to be spread. But regionally, I think issues of biosecurity need to be addressed, both at the region, a continental level, regional, and even at the farm level and the national level. So issues of environmental impact on agriculture have to be addressed definitely. Then implementing uh, climate change, that is also another issue. How do we come up with that? And this is a, 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 it's a participatory um, issue, which we have to also to address in order to streamline and even promote aquaculture. And finally, is the issue of uh, mainstreaming the production system. These days we are talking of production systems. Um, I think for those ones who are well versed with the one CGR, uh, which is the new approach in, in research, we want to address aquaculture as one of, one of the aquaculture production system. But we have to do this uh, when we have already streamlined that into the African policies, both regionally and even uh, nationally. But we also have to recognize the importance of these aqua foods, nutrition, to, to improve the nutritional security. And that's why there was a lot of um, you know, assessments, how, yes, you have the highest production, but why is it, how is it contributing to the communities within your country? But also, finally, is to strengthen the small-scale actors in the aquaculture. There is this tendency where we have these large uh, companies like uh, Lake Harvest and what, but we have these uh, small, small scale actors who are actually contributing to the nutritional, uh, nutritional value chain in the villages or in the other communities. We need to strengthen them, give them the, uh, you know, the you know, low, low cost technologies so that they can also contribute to the production. Otherwise, um, we, 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 we will end up, we still need them uh, to make sure that they also contribute uh, aquaculture in Africa. I beg to submit. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I just want to go over to the next slide. Um, John, that was that was a really nice summary of, of, of the outcome, but also more importantly, also giving us some direction as to where the main challenges and issues lie. Um, so thank you, John. I, I actually, and, and this just caught my eye on the chat panel. Um, there's a postdoc researcher from the Netherlands, I think uh, Furgan Asif, uh, see you writing here, aquaculture governance indicators that you're working on. Um, yeah, please uh, share your work with us. Uh, send us an email afterwards. I'm, I'm really keen to collaborate uh, with you on that. I have a passion for aquaculture policy myself uh, in Africa. So uh, this is the value of these webinars is to get uh, people to talk to each other. Um, lots of interesting people online with us. Peter, all the way from the USA. Um, Walter from Kenya. Dr. Akele from Cameroon. Uh, Kathy from Namibia. Hi, Kathy. I haven't spoke to you for a while. Uh, so really great to have such an international audience. Um, the link to this paper that we've now discussed is on your screen at the moment. Um, if you don't have a pen nearby, uh, this link will also be in your email tomorrow. So don't panic if you, if you can't write down this link or if you don't get a screenshot of it. Uh, we'll certainly make sure you get it. Um, I'm just looking at the clock. We now on just going about nine minutes before the hour. So we've got about half an hour, just a little bit more left. And I really want to use these last 30 minutes uh, to take some questions and, and discussions. I can see many, many questions have been posted in the chat panel and it's, it's quite difficult for me to sift them out there. So I really want to encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A panel. It makes it a lot easier for me to find them and then I can direct those questions um, onto my fellow speakers. Um, 
talking about Kelfan, I think it's Kelfan Masera. Um, Kelfan, I think you with the, I think it's called the Buller Group uh, in Aquaculture Design. You asking how often will this paper be updated? Um, this was this was a once-off paper, but I'm going to also ask Hake or John. Um, Hake, is there a possibility of follow-on research here? Should we Hake perhaps first hear from you and then from John? Yeah, as you said, Etienne, this is, is a one-off paper because part of it, what we were trying to do was stimulate our own thinking of indicators that are important and stimulate general discussions around uh, what is it actually that we mean by successful countries in aquaculture. And these are all publicly available data. Um, so there's an opportunity to update them. We didn't have plans to do so. Um, and well, maybe the aquaculture sector doesn't develop that fast and dynamically at this point that uh, we would need to update this annually, but uh, it could certainly be interesting um, after a certain time to look again to see. Um, but then also related to other indicators, and there were some really interesting suggestions in the q and I saw looking also more at uh, consumed in Africa versus exports, looking at different types of species like seaweeds versus fish, edible versus versus non-edible some interesting ideas in the in the q a so i think there's also um, opportunities to think about other ways of um, sort of analyzing the data and relating it to other types of indicators uh thank thank you hey john did you want to comment on that uh, maybe maybe just to say that this this is uh, this paper was done together with the World Aquaculture Society. This, this is one of the products that we have, and, and we really embrace this information, but uh, we're happy to share this with uh, our, our, I call them my, my bosses, like African Union, to take it up. But that will be one strategy, and, and then maybe a follow-up can be done. Um, but I, I also urge, this, this is information that through the World Aquaculture Society. This, this is, these are the things that we want to tease up, like Hague said, to other African scientists who can take it up, maybe even at, at um, maybe, maybe African Union, that would be the most approach. Because we, we really need um, uh, statistics, like you even rightly said in the beginning, our statistics, yes, we have that, but we need to, I mean, um, rectify them in some cases to really reflect uh, the, the actual, uh, the, the, the reality on ground. So, but th this is something that we can be using uh, as, as a baseline for the continental and then the African Union can take it up from that, from that sense. I, I believe, and there we've been uh, participants on this panel, I mean, on this uh, forum, thank you. Right, uh, John. Thank you for that insight. Yes, certainly, certainly something that can be taken to to the African Union or AUI bar. Um, John, you've again touched on on the fact that statistics are, are sometimes not reliable. We know the statistics in Africa have been questioned. Um, I saw one question come through from the registration process asking. Um, asking how is, is aquaculture production statistics collected in Africa? Um, and from my limited understanding, every country has, has a sovereign responsibility to be reporting their aquaculture statistics to, to the FAO. Um, and countries use different methods, unfortunately, to, to collect their, their aquaculture statistics. So, um, we in the, in this paper certainly we couldn't make room to to go double check. We we certainly didn't have the time or the funds to go into each country and and check on the methodology of of collection of statistics, let alone the accuracy. Um, but I think that is also an important move forward. Um, I think if the rest of the world wants to take Africa seriously, we we need to take our own statistics in Africa quite seriously. Um, so that we do give a, a, a accurate indication of, of what the industry is. I see, I think it's Jens Kale um, on the Q&A panel is writing about whether it's possible to look at, um, at profitability. And Jens here is, is writing that many small scale fish farmers that, um, that make 
make do with their own means of creating their own feed, using their own uh, innovation in small systems. Many of those have, have relatively good profit margins, but they can't scale up. Um, and Jenks is asking in, in the Q&A panel, can we in the future look at that as an indicator as well? So the profit margin in aquaculture per country. So I think the short answer is, is we can look at anything in the future, um, but we've just heard that this is possibly a, a once-off paper, um, but certainly that would make an interesting indicator. And, and there were several other indicators that we debated when this paper was put together. Um, I don't want to just do all the talking myself, but maybe, Haik, um, your views, could, could other indicators also be helpful around putting this information forward? Haik, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think profit margin would be uh, fascinating. I think we were also, in a sense, um, restricted by the data that's available because we wanted to do an Africa-wide study and we wanted to do an initial assessment of um, uh, sort of to get a feel for the general trends. Profitability and profit margins, of course, is much more um, sort of specific and it would be much more difficult to find the data. But I think we could, um, there are different methods that we can use to generate that data at the African level. I think that would take more, um, more effort than collecting secondary data and analyzing it. I think it would probably mean collecting some data and then possibly extrapolating to the continent. But I think it would be a very interesting idea. Another interesting... Um, uh, indicator I would like to look at, but um, where we also don't really have reliable statistics is employment generation. Um, what does it mean for employment generation and where's the potential and who's being employed? What sorts of jobs are we looking at? What sorts of skills do people have that mm -hmm. take the jobs or what don't they have? And uh, mm -hmm. how do we need to invest in human resources to, um, to actually make sure that this is not only beneficial for nutrition, but also beneficial for job creation, for employment generation? for income generation. So that's another area I think would be fascinating to look at. But we, as you say, we fast run into data issues. So we might need to, with some of the interesting indicators, might need to start smaller, lower ambition with a few countries that might be representative and then extrapolate to um, the continent or draw lessons for other countries that are comparable. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Haig, for that insight. Um, NASA Kazozi is, is asking around uh, whether the production includes aquatic plants and seaweeds. Um, NASA, th there's one country which the numbers sometimes, if you, if you don't know the background, the numbers look a bit funny, and that's Tanzania. And, and, and I think it is because seaweed is in there. Um, and I think Haik has also just said we need a, a deeper investigation into the detail. And that's one, one example. Um, we need to go a little bit deeper to have a look at uh, aquatic plants, particularly seaweeds. We know seaweeds makes out a big part of, of the production volume in, in uh, Tanzania. So uh, certainly more room to have a look at that. Um, John, I, I see there were several um, questions around... Um, well, firstly, there's several questions around differentiating between different species, um, which, which is once again a, a difficult detail to get down to. Um, but John, then there was also questions around whether Africa should focus on traditional pond culture uh, or whether it should move to cage culture. And I even saw one question saying, well, shouldn't Africa move to, to RAS or recirculating aquaculture? Um, John, I'm, I'm going to give you a chance to comment on that, but I also want to, I also am aware that some co-authors have or are working or have worked on cage culture. So, John, while you're commenting, um, if there are any of those co-authors that are doing cage culture work, I think Victoria in Kenya and, and Landre in Nigeria, if you guys are online, um, just raise your hand. Maybe we can get a comment from you as well. But John, just first, your comments on, on cages, ponds, RAS, where are we going? Very interesting question. Um, the natural resources, I, I think it's, uh, the way I can say, the natural resources right now, I'm, I'm talking about lakes, rivers, uh, maybe even other wetlands like dams and what. Um, accessing those resources is now becoming very difficult. Um, and, and, and it has also some, 
um, policy implications, especially you find that most of the let's say Great Lakes in, in Africa are actually shared. Most of them are shared lakes. You find, for example, Lake Victoria is shared among its three countries, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. You look at, uh, 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 you look at maybe another one, I, I don't know about Lake Chad, and I don't know if they're potential, but maybe Lake Volta in Ghana. So you find those ones, much as they have the capacity to you be used for cage culture, now I'm talking about cage culture, um, they, those can be potential to produce enough. They have a high efficiency and, and, and also, and, and, but they are labor intensive in a way, but they have a high efficiency in producing enough. And, and by the way, this is where we can realize uh, the, 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 the production numbers that we want to target each country. But in terms of limitations, they, 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 they are not enough. As even someone said, the, 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 the war, the future war, in Africa and other countries is going to be about water. So these natural resources, yes, they can be used for cage culture, but uh, we, we, the issue is now accessing. And the policies have to be made to make sure that at least we access these natural resources sustainably. But also I, I would like to use the scientific approach. Uh, we, we, we find most countries when we use cage culture, um, we are, we are not following the issues of carrying capacity. Uh, we are not following that. What formula are we using uh, to do? So we need to engage research or research institutes to determine the carrying capacity of these lakes to be used for cage culture. Um, that is one. Uh, yes, it's be used, but how do we use it sustainably? And we, used, we need to use evidence-based research. For example, I know Boyd. Boyd has already done that, Cloud Boyd. And, and, and we, we use those ratio between those, that percentage, maybe 1% of the, the whole total surface area. But we need to use that and we do that if, um, using the Research Institute and the National to determine the carrying capacity. And that will guide us to avoid the issue of uh, disease, I mean, uh, pollution. But also um, in terms of, uh, that, that is one emerging aspect that there's a lot of now cage, cage farming. Then the other issue is about, what about these land-based systems like the ponds and even tanks? Uh, I think to me, that would be the future uh, of, of aquaculture in Africa, because I, this is where we have enough land, although even land is now becoming an issue because of the population. But I, I would think we, we can use technologies like aquaponics, what and what for, we develop low cost technologies for let's say aquaponics and, and, and for, for people who can be used uh, to grow fish. And I, I like the example in Nigeria, the backyard tanks where they're growing a lot of catfish. That could be uh, passed on throughout even other countries because the natural resources, yes, we can use cages, they're highly efficient, but not everybody can access these uh, natural resources. So I think it's, it's better we, we, we now come up with technologies that can be embraced, like, the, like I said, the cage, the, the tank systems in Nigeria. And that will be actually the future. Uh, we are talking of a farm, a, a household, which is around half an acre, which can grow, which can utilize uh, even the rainfall and use that maybe interchangeably to grow fish. And this has been successfully done. That's why Nigeria is growing up very quickly. But uh, yes, highly efficient systems can be used, but I believe the future of aquaculture is the land-based systems. All right, John, good, uh, good insights. And I know we, we can probably have a, a debate for three days around, around which systems would work for Africa. Um, Moving on, Max, uh, Max Troll makes a very interesting comment in the question panel. Um, he says, initiatives to increase small-scale aquaculture in Africa by the World Bank, FAO, etc., were initiated many years ago, um, but have not really triggered large-scale adoption. Um, have you, in your review, identified factors that prevented development? So, um, Max, the short answer is no. Uh, the, this, this paper looks at what the numbers are, but, but hasn't really delved into looking at the reasons. There, there are 
for instance, in Lesotho, we know there's high value species that influence the numbers, but, but that's very, uh, let's say very plain uh, reasons that we were able to find. Um, looking at, at, at more in-depth reasons, whether social, political, uh, economic, uh, John referred to technology, looking at those reasons uh, certainly hasn't been in, in the scope of this paper and, and maybe something to look at in the future. Um, a, a counter comment to, to Max's writing was uh, Joachim Kuzembila writing, aquaculture benefits from very little or almost no investment from African governments and business persons. Um, and this is one of the major causes. So, so you can see there's, there's varying views on, on, on how this is playing out. And I don't think any one of us has all of the answers uh, to be able to, to give a, a, a definitive way forward. Um, I see we've got about, I think we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so what I'm going to do, I am still working through some questions in the Q&A panel. You're welcome to keep posting questions there. I'm going to make a few announcements um, because I know if I leave the announcements to the end, everybody disappears and nobody hears the important news. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to provide one or two people with an opportunity to open their microphones to ask a question live. Um, so if you want to ask something live, you're welcome to raise your hand. And uh, as soon as I've done the announcements, then we'll come to one or two live questions uh, if there are live questions. So moving on, uh, as I said, the link of the paper will be in your email tomorrow. Allow me to make a few announcements. Um, I do want to say that uh, Aquaculture Africa magazine is, is making good progress in Africa. Um, we've set a goal to, to have a email, direct email contact base of 10,000 people for this year. Uh, we ended off last year at about 8,000. So our direct media and social media is still growing strongly. Um, many of you would have received emails that says um, opt in or opt out. Uh, that is an effort by AAM uh, so that we don't get caught up in spam filters. Uh, we don't want to be spam. We want to be important news. Uh, emails go out once a week. Webinars now are planned more or less once in two weeks. Um, so please watch the space AAM is, is growing and meeting the need for communication and aquaculture across Africa. The new website is up and running. Yes, it's, there is still some glitches and some areas that have not been populated, but at least it's on air. I can report that the price index for African aquaculture products is progressing well. Uh, we should have the next installment out quite soon. And then several webinars, interesting webinars are coming up. I'll report on that on the next slide. But most importantly, I need all of you to help us keep this platform free. Um, the only way we keep this platform free is to get it sponsored uh, by, by other organizations. And sponsors are interested in numbers. So if you keep benefiting from the information and you keep participating in the events, uh, that will make sure that we keep the sponsors here and that will make sure that we can keep uh, the events going. Um, the other big thing that uh, AAM has embarked on is uh, to make sure that we build capacity within our own organization uh, we realize that if we want to serve the communication needs in Africa, we need more people. Um, so I can proudly say uh, Bushera Kadandu from Uganda has joined our team. She's now working in AAM full time. Bushera has just joined the panel. Bushera, can you open up your camera and your microphone and just very briefly say hi to everybody? Uh, so that they know who you are, and uh, mm. we can proudly say that we've now got uh, got somebody in house to do all of the work for AAM. Shira, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Etan. Ah, great, Bushira. I'm going to force you to say one or two words about yourself, uh, just who you are, and uh, and then at least the audience know who they're working with. In okay, thank you, Etan. It will be a brief one. Hello, everyone. My name is Bush Eira Kadondo. I'm from Uganda and I'm a social worker. 
with a bachelor's degree with a bachelor's degree from Uganda Christian University. I'm currently attached to the AM in Uganda and I'm working with ETN directly. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bashira. It's really nice to have help in the AAM office. Um, and uh, that is the lady that you will be dealing with um, administratively. Thank you, Bushira. Nice to have you online. Thank you. Right, then on upcoming webinars, um, I need specifically students, researchers, universities, and the likes to be listening to this. On the 17th of March, we've got a short webinar, 90 minute webinar that's going to deal with uh, another publication called A Pocket Guide to Scientific Writing and Aquaculture Research. Many of you would know Rodrigue Yossa. Um, Rodrigue provided probably our top webinar last year when he spoke about feed formulation. It was exceptionally well attended. He has now written this, uh, this book around uh, scientific writing for aquaculture research. So if you are in aquaculture research, or if you're a student, this is one that you cannot miss. Um, Rodrigue is going to be running us through this publication and giving some real nice guidance around uh, scientific writing for aquaculture. If you don't get that link, um, I'll make sure it's in your email tomorrow so that you can register for that webinar on the 17th of March. Then, in fact, two days before that, on the 15th of March, We've got a short build up to the All Africa session that will be held in the conference, the AFRAC conference in Egypt. Um, those of you that have the privilege to go to Egypt will know, will possibly know about the All Africa session at the conference where we discuss progress in African aquaculture and where it's going and where we want it to go. But we realize that there are many people that uh, want a voice in African aquaculture but will not be able to attend the session. So on the 15th of March, we are having a discussion so that we can hear those voices and take those voices into the session that will be held in Egypt towards the end of March. So if you are passionate about aquaculture in Africa, please attend on the 15th. I will also get that link through to you on email tomorrow. Um, we hope to have the final program for the year ready soon. I can tell you there's more work coming on vaccines, more on tilapia and various other topics. We've been asked as recently as yesterday to run a webinar on in-pond raceways. Um, so various topics that we will be covering uh, throughout the rest of this year. Um, right, I've come to the end of the announcements. Uh, we still have a little bit of time left. I have invited people uh, to provide or put a hand up if you want to ask anything live. Um, I just want to see what hands we've got. I see NASA Kazozi, you've put your hand up. Um, NASA, I am now going to allow you to talk. Uh, I've opened up your microphone. So NASA, please proceed and ask your question live. Thank you, Etienne, and thank you all the authors for the for the working paper. It's really good enough. Uh, my problem or my concern was with the production value, whereby Egypt being the major producer of aquaculture products in Africa, but when it comes to a production value, you see that it was uh, <coughs> trailing backwards. And one of the reasons which Etienne gave was that uh, because of the low uh, low value aquatic species which they are gr growing and from my understanding it's basically tilapia and that one becomes a very big problem to the sub-saharan africa including uganda kenya and Ta uganda kenya and tanzania Burundi, and rwanda and some few countries that in these countries tilapia is the major 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 aquatic species which is being cultured by farmers so if it is a low aquatic value species, what, what can we do? What can we do? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nasa. You've made a, a very, very important point. Um, I'm going to hand to John in a second, uh, but I would like to just say, <laughs> John, yes, you can get the difficult part. Um, okay. I would like to just say briefly, uh, 
we must not forget the context of, of, of food security. Um, so high value in monetary terms and high value in food security um, are two very different things. And uh, we cannot simply say we're not going to farm tilapia because it doesn't have a high value. It does have a high value as a food security product. Um, and, and we can't lose that out of context. John, I'm letting you add on to this because that's about the best way yeah. I can see it. Yeah, you've actually answered partly. It. Um, but uh, like I said before, I think research and development has to be funded. And I know most countries have uh, issues with uh, funding uh, research programs, national research programs. But I think we, if we borrow that issue of uh, private sector-led research, um, I think that one will solve the issue. However, just going back straight to the issue, is the issue of diversification. <clears throat> um, I, I can just talk in, um, maybe for example, in Uganda, we are trying to bring on board other high valued species, like now patch. The attempts in Uganda right now to domesticate uh, Nile patch. Nile patch is well known for its high value um, um, as a high valued species, fish species. So I, I think other countries as well can borrow suit uh, to identify which are those uh, high valued species and come up with the breeding technologies which, which, can, um, which can be domesticated and even take, been taken up by uh, even other farmers. So it's, it's the issue of just funding research in Africa to look at those uh, diversify to help on diversification of, of species that are of high value in nature. And, and maybe that's when we can bring on board to species. But the issue because of funding, I, I think a private sector led uh, research will, will be very feasible. I, I beg to submit br briefly that. Right, uh, thank, thank you, John, for that. Uh, there was another hand up. Ibrahim um, Muhammad Bukhar, I think. Uh, Ibrahim, I'm opening up your microphone. You're welcome to ask your question. Ibrahim, you seem to be muted. Um, go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Mohamed. Yes, my question is that, uh, is there any uh, way that you people, you can help us in Nigeria to export catfish to the outside country as other country doing it? Great, um, thank you, Ibrahim, for, for that question. Um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to try not answer that because I think there are, there are better people to advise on export of catfish from Nigeria than, than well, myself. John, sorry, I'm talking on your behalf, and heck, sorry on your behalf, but I think no, there are, challenge. yeah, there, there are people like uh, like Lanray uh, in that area, which I think understand those markets uh, much better. John, do you want to maybe add something to that? I, I think there is already an initiative, um, and and I, it's through African uh, World Aquaculture Society and African uh, AUIBA where they would like to see, uh, utilize the African continent free trade, uh, continent of free trade agreement um, or area, where we would like to see aquaculture also being positioned in, into this aspect where issues of markets can be addressed. However, one, one thing which we need to know is um, there's this issue of liberalization. Um, we, 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 each country has to do that, but I would like to borrow a, a leaf from the, Af the, the women. They've developed, they've come up with a continental, uh, an African network of which they are talking together on and address issues of marketing. So probably even fish farmers, you, you need to come up with that network of which uh, you will um, uh, uh, try to develop this market among its yourselves and share information where it's needed, where the demand for catfish is needed and what. As I speak, we have mm -hmm. an area here in Uganda where we have catfishes, which is being brought from South Sudan and even Sudan. There's a different type of catfish. 
and it is highly liked. But uh, it's because of the, 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 the network they have developed between the market people. So I think let us borrow the, the, the women, how they have developed it. There's an African fish women network for Africa. Probably we need to come up with that. And it can be done through World Aquaculture Society to come up with that platform. And then you, you link up with other, uh, with other countries and, and facilitate that, that trade. Otherwise, uh, me, the way in Africa I've seen, the regional market has not been harnessed enough to, 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 to sell our fish. This regional market, we always think of export market to EU, USA, but we have not yet harnessed our regional market here in Africa. And that's why we need these networks, the World Aquaculture Society and one, where we could harness these markets and, and, and explore these markets within ourselves. There's a lot of, there's a huge demand of fish in African regions, but we have not explored that. I think so. All right, thank, thank you, John. Very good insight there. Um, we're running into the last few minutes. Uh, Kelfan Masera, I see you've uh, said our WhatsApp group is full. Um, it has been full for, for a very long time, uh, Kelfan. Unfortunately, WhatsApp only takes about 250 people. Um, we do run a uh, tele, what is it called? Telegram, hey? Um, we do run a Telegram group, which I think now stands at about 700 people. Um, Kelfan, I will make sure the links to those groups are in your emails tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to encourage everybody to use the Telegram group because we're certainly not going to start multiple WhatsApp groups uh, for AAM. Um, in fact, we, we would like to just have one big group, but that's another, another discussion. Ulf uh, Nomak from Botswana, thanks Ulf making the comment that uh, we can't have a one size fits all solution, um, particularly in production systems for Africa. Uh, very valid, uh, valid point you make Ulf, thank you for that. Um, Ian Goulding, uh, Ian makes a, also a very, very important point asking whether the, the investments and support by government um, in matters like extension, in matters like state-owned hatcheries and so forth, whether that does not possibly discourage private sector investment. Um, and and I'm, I'm actually, I can see John also thinking about that. Mike, hey, you're not from Africa. It's, it's a very, very important matter. And it's certainly not a matter that we're going to be able to get answers to in, in this webinar and in the few minutes that we've got left. But I, I do think we need to come back to that, Ian. Um, I, I don't really want to put Hake on the spot because she's not from Africa. Um, John, sorry to put you back on the spot. Your views, John, you sit within a state institution. So maybe your views as to the role of, of, of the state. I, I think I, I agree with him, entirely agree with him, that, that uh, I, I think um, the way I see government should play its role by ensuring quality, uh, ensuring, um, um, by providing quality assurance in terms of seed, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, out, the things that are, the materials that are going to be used in uh, aquaculture. Aquaculture can only be, we've seen this the time, of, I've been in aquaculture for more than 20 years, but the experience I've seen, and in Uganda here, it is the private sector that has drove uh, aquaculture uh, to, to grow very fast in, in Uganda and even other countries. I think less, we agree, government plays its low role by providing policies, but even in uh, providing quality assurance with materials that are going to be used in the industry. And then we leave the private sector to come up with, uh, to come up with, uh, to drive, you know, seed production, seed multiplication and what. Uh, but what he mentioned by uh, the, the, the issues of regional, maybe coming up with hatcheries in different regions of the country, still comes in the issue of the quality seed, because that is an issue in most enterprises, aquaculture enterprises in Africa. Seed, seed is an issue. But how do we ensure the quality of seed 
to be supplied by the end users. That's where you need the government. But who will promote business, the multiplication and everything of this seed, the, uh, the quality seed, quality declared seed? That would be the private sector. So I, I think the role of government should mainly policy and maybe ensuring the quality of the seed. And not only the seed, but even the feed itself. At Etienne, one thing which you have to see in Africa, as I speak, over, I think, 80% of the feed, the best feed, which is used in most aquaculture in the, uh, 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 establishment, is imported. Is imported. And, and so government has maybe to also invest in research to come up with the um, research which can substitute and provide and even lower down the cost of production by investing into feed, feed technology. I can give you an example of in here in Uganda where we are trying to substitute uh, the, the, the insects with the, the fish meal. And we believe this one will, re, will lower down the cost of production. So such, such investments can be done by government, but together with the private sector, private sector has a very big role in driving aquaculture in, in, in Uganda, and I agree. Ours let us provide the policy, the working environment, but let the private sector do the rest. Ours to ensure the quality, I beg to submit. Right, thank you, John. I, I, think, I think it's a whole another set of webinars to, to decipher the role of government and, and the private sector. So we, we have virtually run out of time. Um, Tim Messeder, I see your hand has been up. Tim, if you can keep it very short, uh, we squeeze in your question quickly. Tim, uh, you are live to talk. Hi, everybody. Uh, I will keep it brief. So, thanks so much for the session. Uh, my name is Tim Esther here. I'm a small scale producer in Uganda. And I was just wondering, you know, how can I ask how small scale producers are represented in the statistics? Because my feeling is they're not very well represented. What would be the panel's view on that? Uh, thank you, Tim. Very important question. Um, it, and I'm going to give to John also, but Tim, we've relied solely in this paper on, on data collected internationally, primarily by the FAO. And the FAO relies in turn on, on the governments of, of these various countries. And, and those governments have varying methodologies, uh, some of them good, some of them bad. Uh, some of them we know ignore small-scale farmers. Um, in some countries, we, we think the statistics are over and underreported for various reasons, whether political or otherwise. So, so Tim, in short, I, I, I do think we've, we, we, we have got a lot of work to improve not only representation of small-scale farmers, but, but generally accuracy of, of information. John, did you want to add anything to that? I, I think the... Generally, it's over 70 percent 70 of that, that information is actually from uh, small scale, um, small scale farmers. It is actually the, the, the composition of um, producers from aquaculture in, in Uganda. I mean, I mean, in Africa, over 70 percent are small scale. And that's why it's very important to, to strengthen them with one, one of the recommendations, which is said, to strengthen them to make sure that they, they efficiently produce um, enough, uh, to, to, to enough for the industry and even for the nation. Um, yes, I think that one needs, the data is not decent. When you look at the FAO and even World Bank, it doesn't clearly distinguish who are the small scale and who are the, the, you know, the large, so-called large scale. But recently, when you see even the statistics, uh, the, the contribution of the intensive or large scale, there's a huge contribution from these, especially cage farmers, uh, who are producing enormously uh, for, for, for the sector. But uh, if you add on cumulatively, even the small scale are uh, also producing. But remember, they have, even the small scale are divided into two. I know time is over. We have those ones who are subsistently small scale, but they are also those who are small scale, but producing for the markets. 
those ones are now coming up. There's an emerging number of those. And I think those ones, we, they are quite many. I beg to say. Great. John, uh, that's our final insight. We have run out of time. Um, just before I ask for, for one last short word from Hake, um, I do want to just encourage you to interact with uh, the panel members. Their email addresses are on the, on the screen. Um, I've just received a message around our Telegram group saying that some people want to take this discussion onto that group. I'm happy to do that. I will put the Telegram link uh, into your emails tomorrow as well. Um, so please join us there. Uh, we have real trouble trying to keep spam off that group. Uh, people trying to sell you shares and make you rich quick, but uh, we do try hard. So if you join up on that group, keep it alive, keep it aquaculture focused. Uh, thank you very much, John and Hick, for your time this afternoon. It's, I've really had fun um, and it's been a good discussion. Last word, Hake, from you, just as we close. Thank you, Etienne, and thank you so much for organizing this. I learned a lot today. I really enjoyed it. And I, I, we took note of all the different ideas that uh, participants had of other things we could look at and it, really interesting research questions and discussions that could be had. So I'm really hoping that we can continue delving deeper <clears throat> into different topics that were touched on today. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Haik. John, I'm scared to give you the last word because I'm scared you'll take more time. But very shortly, John, your last words. Yeah, I all look, I, I'm very grateful for this session. And to me, I believe the future of aquaculture is going to be in Africa. And let's meet again in Egypt because we have the resources, we have the materials, we, we, are, we are the mother of everything. The future of Africa, of the continental uh, aquaculture is going to be in Africa, 10 to 20 years ahead. Let's keep on with this uh, energy. We'll see the uh, aquaculture growing very well in Africa. Thank you very much, Etienne. Excellent, John. On those uh, positive words, thank you everybody for attending. Join us in two weeks time. We've got two events in two weeks time. I'll get the links out to you. Thank you. Have a great day where you are. I'll leave the email addresses on for another minute or two and uh, we'll see all of you shortly. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.